Tech News Weekly is sponsored by Audible.com, the internet's leading provider of audiobooks, with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature. Stitcher Radio. Listen on the go via the Stitcher mobile app. For more information, go to stitcher.com slash gfq. And by Ting, mobile that makes sense. Go to gfq.ting.com and get a $25 credit when signing up. Starting Tech News Weekly in 3, 2, 1... Hey everybody, welcome to Tech News Weekly. I'm Andrew Zarian. After taking a good two weeks off, or three weeks off, when is the last time you did a show, John? Well, you did one with Michael when I, I was was busy, but I think it was like first week of March. You haven't been on for about three weeks, but uh, after yeah. having three weeks off, uh, Suncast is back on the show. It's only me and him. We're going old school today. It's going to be uh, him and myself discussing everything that happened in technology, everything that's interesting in technology that happened this week, and uh, you know, I, I, we we were having this discussion before the show started, and I think it was a pretty eventful week uh, with a lot of smaller stories that came out rather than these huge yeah. announcements. We saw the Samsung announcement, which we'll talk about. We didn't get a chance to talk about that, but uh, a lot of small things happened. A lot of uh, some big things happened, which we're going to get to too. But before we go into the news, I want to remind everybody: you could get all our shows archived on our website at gfknetwork.com. Also, if you uh, if you are on the go, or if you like to use any of these podcatcher apps, we're uh, we're available everywhere podcasts are available, and uh, definitely subscribe to us, guys, because it's a big help when you subscribe to our show. It, it helps us out with the numbers, and we are able to present that to advertisers. And uh, I won't foreclose on my house, so uh, that that's my uh, that's my little and I won't get plug. kicked out of your basement, and you won't get kicked out of my basement. Actually, you know what? I take that back. I will probably not foreclose on my house. But Suncast will have to be evicted so I can rent it out to a five <laughs> to to a family of six members to live all in my basement. And it won't be pretty, guys. It won't be pretty. No, won't. Uh, so I guess we should start out with the Samsung announcement that uh, that came down last week. Uh, we have not spoken about this, so I'm not going to go heavy into uh, what was said, but uh, I want to get your opinion, uh, John. Do you, do you like this phone? What do you think of it? To me, and I got a lot of slack over this, saying this on, on What the Tech, I believe that the phone is is a solid Android phone, nothing wrong with that, but they have so much bloatware on this thing, and so many gimmicks were added to this phone, where it kind of takes away from the, the core of it. Yeah, I can kind of see that. Um See, here's the thing. There's a couple of uh, of gimmicks, like you said, that they did. Um, the the eye scrolling thing. That's the thing that I don't quite understand, and I don't think like they they had this whole media press event. Uh, they had like every blog cover this. They 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 had the usual demo room where you could do things and show it off to people that, that were attending there as press or media. But nobody really talked a whole lot about this eye scrolling thing and just how is this supposed to work? How well does it work? Yeah, and, and, and that that's was my one point. Of the things that I think a lot of people have questions about. Yeah, that was my point with this thing where where they were talking about the eye scrolling, they're talking about the gesturing, and from what I saw over the last couple of days from people that have been using it, it does not work well at all. See. It, I think that's partly due to it being like a first generation type of deal. I mean, it, everybody knows that the first time that you do something, it's just not going to be that great. It, it's like when the iPhone first came out, it didn't have MS, MMS on there. You couldn't do picture messaging. And it lacked a lot of other features that you do have standard today. And I think that does play into it a little bit, but it's still one of those things that if it doesn't work that well, why play it up to the degree that Samsung did? Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I think this is this is their thing now. What they're trying to do is fill it up with as much as they can. I mean, they're, they're literally pushing this thing to the extreme with applications and features and uh, all these things to kind of give it the advantage over everybody everybody else. And they're selling it as well. You we everything everything you want is on this phone. You don't need anything else. This is all you need. 
This is the phone that you need. In, in, in a way, <laughs> uh, uh, Apple and Samsung or Android is kind of in the same boat that BlackBerry and RIM were in, you know, a couple of years ago, where they, they keep coming out with all these new generations of devices. And there's just, it's more of an evolutionary step where it, it's just, you know, like they've added Wi Fi or they added GPS or they added something here. Like they, they changed the, uh, the, uh, Wi-Fi versions, what you can connect to. Instead of being just 802.11b, you can now also connect to 802.11b and G. And, and that's kind of what I'm feeling here is that in a way they, they can increase these speeds because we're still in a way improving how much we can do with the, these the hardware that's so much smaller than what we're used to with desktops because we're still kind of advancing a lot in that area. But we're still not making a lot of headway, I think, with the overall experience of it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Do you think these are features that a lot of these phones need, John? I mean, we're we're seeing that they're able to do the humidity on on where you are. I mean, next is going to be the barometric pressure, God forbid. Uh, are these features that we need on phones, or are they just trying to pack it in with as many things as possible, and then they could turn around and say? Um, Oh hey, look! Uh, our phone could could tell you the weather, uh, you know, with 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 eye scrolling. I, I think kind of what they're trying to do is like what Apple did when they first came on the scene. It's like they had this device that was just a complete game changer to the smartphone world. I think that's kind of what they're trying to redo with these features. Is trying to be the first to be able to uh, come out with one of these new features that just make it a must-have smartphone for anybody. Yeah, I, I mean, it really, it, it's, a, it's a strange, strange little thing that they're doing, but I, I, it's working for them. I mean, Samsung is the dominant player in the Android market. They are, they're, they're right up there with iOS That's when it comes to phones. they put out a phone every eight months. Yeah, I mean, that, that could kind of do it too, but do you think it's also it also has to do with the fact that they're actually decent phones? I have a Note 2 here, which I think is a pretty good phone, but I don't like the Samsung add-ons to the phone i would rather have a pure android experience and have these features implemented in android than samsung it could be that there is just more friendly to hacking with roms i guess so but that, i mean that's i think that is a big do. part of it as, as far as you know a lot of people that do buy android like it because they can easily put on whatever rom is out there and there's there's a lot of different ROMs to choose from. You don't have just one or two or three. It's not like you have an iPhone and you jailbreak it and, and you automatically have uh, the, the Cydia store. Yeah. With a, a ROM, you have all these different choices for customizing the way it's all set up. Yeah, but uh, the average user does not care about ROMs, right? They're not going to go in. I don't. I, I was talking to someone about this and, and they were telling me, oh, I'm going to get this phone. Um, and I asked them why they're going to get it. He goes, well, I'm going to take it home and I'm going to put a ROM on there and, and, you know, and root the phone and put a ROM. I'm like, but that shouldn't be one of the things that you do when you buy a phone. You should buy the phone and the phone should have the features that you want rather than you modifying it to work the way you want it to work. Right. I mean, I don't – that's my thing. Like, I have an Android phone and I root the thing and I put ROMs on here so I get the latest updates. It shouldn't be like that. If you have a certain phone, you should be able to get the updates every time that Google releases an update. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. I think there's a lot of these these issues here, like um, it, even, even the pure Google phones. I mean, the pure Android experience. You get the Nexus phone and you may not get the update. They may decide not to give you the update, but they're going to give it to the older Nexus phone. So there's these weird inconsistencies in the Android it's, it's market. It's kind of hard because in a way you're you're spending so much money on this stuff that in a way you need some sort of long-term support because not only are you currently bound by, you know, usually carrier contracts for at least 2 years when you get a new device. So you I think in a way you almost need to have at least 18 to 24 months of, you know, support behind that device that w with some sort of updates because obviously in two years, that phone's going to be completely outdated. But if you could offer some sort of uh, continual update to keep it somewhat fresh and updated. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think of the camera? The 13 megapixel camera in this thing, uh, I, it's still, from what I have heard, it is still not as good as the iPhone. Uh, do you think they're missing something here? Do you think everybody's missing? This was a big discussion the other day because the Nexus 5 phone is rumored to have a Nikon sensor in it. 
Well, if you remember, HTC just uh, announced the HTC One not too long ago, and they were talking about having this 5-megapixel sensor in there, but because it was a larger sensor, it was going to take better images. Well, I actually saw some some sample shots of the HTC One, and quite frankly, I was very unimpressed with, really? with the sample shot that I saw. Well, uh, it could have been just been that one shot, but uh, from what I saw, it, it did not look that great. It looked like you know, a five megapixel camera, not and not a good one. I assume. No, <laughs> see, that's the problem. I, I, I'm, I've always been wondering why can't these guys figure it out? Why can't they just, I don't know, pull, do you make a deal with like Canon or Nikon and, and just put a really decent sensor in this thing. You know, there's some new technology out there um, that, that a lot of uh, DSLRs are starting to use now, which is called mirrorless, where, where it, it doesn't have an actual mirror in the lens. And, and I'm just wondering if they could somehow take what they've learned from doing mirrorless DSLRs and adapt that to smartphones to have some better optics. Yeah. The, the, also, the, the argument with these things is that well, they need they need optical zoom. They don't have optical. They don't have optical, and digital zoom is not good. Well, we were talking about this uh, the other day. Logitech is releasing a new webcam, uh, the Logitech C930, and it's going to allow you to do up to four x digital zoom, and it will not affect the quality of the video. The video will be just as good as it is when you're not zoomed in. And if this mm. is true, if this, this actually does work the way that they're saying it's going to work, it's kind of going to change the way digital zoom is perceived. Uh, a lot of the arguments are, well, the phone doesn't have optical zoom, so it, obviously you can't zoom in and make the picture look good. I, I think it's kind of funny in the sense that uh, how long have we been talking about how bad cameras and smartphones are and that we've kind of been looking for somebody to uncrown the iPhone as the king of cameras and smartphones. And, and oh, yet we still haven't really got there, I Well, think. since day one, right? Since day one of the iPhone. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, they, it has always been far, far more superior than anything else on the market. And we've seen a lot of close seconds, but really there's nothing that has taken the place of the iPhone. No. And to me, that's disappointing. Yeah. I mean, not that I'm not dissatisfied with the quality that I get with my iPhone. It's just that, why can't we do better? Yeah, that's a very good question. Why can't we? And and I guess we'll never find out because it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> We're never going to find out. Uh, to kind of move on to the next story here, which I was excited about this. Verizon is in talks to change the way cable uh, television is perceived. They're looking to... Uh, oh, you have a different story here. Oh, excellent. Now, now this kind of goes into two things because you have a different story and I have a different story. Verizon is really trying to shake things up where they're trying to do uh, TV channels based on the real viewing time. So yes. how is this going to work? They're going to kind of change the way that... Uh, basically, what they're doing is that they're, they're kind of in talks with these smaller networks and in, independent channels where the, they're saying that they would Verizon would pay whenever a subscriber tunes in for at least five minutes. In theory, it's kind of like a win-win strategy in which we don't necessarily get um, stuck up front with channels that we don't necessarily ha want and we still have to pay for. I mean, that's kind of the whole thing is that we get all these channels that we don't necessarily care for, but we still have to pay for. Whereas what they're saying with this is that we still have access to those channels, but we don't pay unless we actually watch these channels for at least five minutes. Yeah, I, I think that's phenomenal because I only watch like four channels. I really well, there you go. So how are they going to bill me? You know what I mean? Like that's the weird thing. I, I don't know. I don't think it's going to be these drastic changes to the way that we're billed. You know, I don't you're not think we ever see something like this with with the larger networks like Fox and, and NBC or ABC. I, I just don't ever see that happening. I, I just don't. I just don't think that they'd be willing to do something like that. No, I think what's going to happen is we're going to see a lot of these like uh, the wealth channel. I don't know if you, you if you have that there, but there's a channel called the wealth channel here. I they they really don't have any kind of programming other than just they they give you tours of of locations, different places in the world, uh, and they have like the wealth news, which is really weird to watch. It, it looks a step above public access, 
and much closer to a YouTube parody video. It's bizarre. Hmm. But they, um, I don't know anybody that watches this thing, and their ratings cannot be over 20,000 for their most watched show. How do they continue to run it then? That's the amazing part. I don't understand how they continue to survive. Like, I'll give you an example. Gary Delabate from The Howard Stern Show and John Hine launched a show on VH1. Last week, it debuted. It debuted at 3 o'clock in the morning on VH1. Below 20,000 people watched it. Under 20,000 people. And this is, yeah, it's at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I've seen videos on YouTube with more hits than that. 20,000 people watched it. At that point, I understand they're putting out programming and they're putting out content at 3 in the morning. But that those are numbers that this network gets on their most watched show. So how do you survive? I guess you, you, you sucker some people into ad revenue or your uh, whatever larger company that owns you is willing to take the loss on you. I think this is great. I, I, I don't watch any of these channels. But I'm paying for them. I'm paying about three hundred dollars a month for my cable. Yeah. I'm really curious how this works for people that are like hardcore channel surfers, like people that flip back and forth That's and back me. and forth. Do they just keep a running tab of how long you've actually been on that channel, whether whether you've changed it or not? Like if I'm watching Fox and I change it to NBC and then I go back to Fox, does it still start counting again from where I was? Like if I watch a minute of Fox changed it to NBC for a minute and then went back to Fox as it continues time from like one minute or something. I'm really bad with that. I'm constantly switching the uh, the channels. I mean, or does always. it like reset after you? Because that's that's the thing that I don't quite understand. Like if they say you have to watch it for at least five minutes. Well, if I'm only watching, you know, a channel for, you know, two minutes here and there. So if, so if I watched for like four minutes and 59 seconds and then I just flip to another channel and then changed back to what I was watching, does it not count? I guess it, it, it I guess it adds, it tallies it up. Um, that's, that's how I'm guessing they're going to, they're going to get you. Well, how many channels do you watch? I'm just curious because I'll tell you what I watch. I'll watch, uh, pretty much. I'll never watch a lot of these shows live. I'll watch it on demand. And it's probably I'm watching maybe seven shows a week, and they're all across. So maybe maybe at most I'm watching ten channels, and that's it. Showtime, CBS, ABC, and uh, I, I can't even, and maybe like the Science Channel. Yeah, there's there's probably you know, well you know twenty channels or or. So that I watch at most the rest I could really care less about. I mean, stuff here and there is sometimes on, but part of the problem with, with this on demand stuff is that not everything is on demand. Like some no, of the yeah. stuff that I just absolutely love to watch is never on demand. Like you can't get it in, unless you catch it live or on one of the select repeats. You'll never see it. Yeah. And that bugs me. Like, I don't understand why you can see a show on like um, CNN, uh, but then you'll never ever ever catch it again. Like they have stuff that they repeat, you know, during the night in the early morning. But if you don't catch one of those times, well, then you'll never get to see that show. Like Red Eye. Yeah, Red Eye is a great show that it, it's on at three a.m. and that's it. Do they do they provide it online or no? No. I, I mean, no, if you don't watch it at 3 a.m., you don't see it. I mean, you can DVR it, but if you don't have a DVR. Yeah. I mean, which DVRs are pretty useless now with, with on demand programming. I mean, nobody needs a DVR if you're able to on demand everything. Yeah. It's interesting, though. I, I hope they break that model. I hope they change something. But Netflix, on the other hand, uh, is planning and, and wants 4K streaming in one to two years. Now, this is, to me, this is kind of insane considering they can't even do 1080p yet for most people. <laughs> most people can't stream it. I mean, they're, they're looking at 4K, which is uh, Ultra HD. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is a realistic thing for them to do? And what is their library going to look like of 4K shows and movies? I, I don't think there are many things recorded in 4K. YouTube actually has some content already that's in 4K, but it's very rare that you'll come across something that's 4K. Have you attempted to watch it? I've, I've attempted to watch it, I think, once or twice, but it, you, you really don't tell the difference when you're on a screen that's smaller than 
4K, you know? It's, it's when you want to actually watch it at that resolution. You know, it's like taking 720p or 1080p and trying to watch it on a 4K TV. Yeah. It's, it's just not necessarily going to look the same. Yeah. Um, uh, do you think this is a realistic thing for them to, let's say, a year or two? Let's say, let's say 20, 24 months from now. Do you think it's yeah, possible? Yeah, I, I think two years is realistic. I can't see it being done in less than two years because you got to think about the fact that... Um, See, it's, it's, there's going to be so few people that can even do that, for one, because it's not like we have um, codecs right now. We're working on new codecs and encoders to uh, compress this content that's at these higher resolutions into something that's more manageable. Because we have this new technology coming out called HEVC, mm -hmm. which is the successor to this like X264 and H.264 current version that we're using now and HEVC does about about half um, the you can do about half the bit rate at, at nearly the same quality as you can with today's current standard for compression yeah so if you're and, doing and let's, say, kind of let's say you're doing in order to deliver uh, high quality content with a lower bit rate yeah so let's say you're doing 800k right that's, let's say you're doing a thing that's yeah. that's 800 kilobits uh, you're able to drop it down to 400 and offer the same quality. Near, near the same quality. It's not exactly the same quality, but that's just because they haven't tweaked this. It's still very early in its development stage. So, um, But that is one of the things that we, in a way, have to reach first before 4K becomes ubiquitous like 720p is now. Pretty much anybody can play 720p video on the Internet, and, and that's not a problem. 4K and 1080p, on the other hand, it's a little bit harder. 1080p, you can do that, but 4K, I, I just don't see a whole lot of people being able to do that. But we're talking One, streaming, the, John. We're talking yeah, streaming media. I, I don't in think... In order to deliver that content, you, you're going to have to deliver a file that's, you know, uh, 10 gigabytes. Yeah, I mean, I don't think most that's people... That's what the realistic thing is about 4K, is that you're probably going to have to stream a 10 gigabyte file to a user. I, I think a lot of people could do 720p... Uh, I realistically, I don't think they could do 1080p streaming right now because I believe Netflix requires you to have four megabits, uh, at least four megabits dedicated to that stream. So let's say four megabits yeah. consistent. So let's say you need at least 10 meg, 10 meg uh, connection. Uh, I, I mean, there's a lot of things that just have to happen. Just technology has yeah. to improve. Do you think two, we're two it, years it, away from a new standard being adapt, adapted into oh, yeah. you know encoding? Yeah. Really? You're going to have to. In, in order for these networks to be able to do 4K, they just have to have these new compression technology in order to reduce the size of um, the, the video. I, I mean, that's just what it comes down to is to be able to fit this stuff into what we've got today, you have to compress it. Very interesting, and I, and I know that's very highly technical, but that's, that's no. Kind I, of I did. I just did. I just can't imagine them being two years away from this because look how long it's taken them to implement 1080p. It's still not implemented, and 1080p has been around for at least quite a few years. Yeah, but I think I think the the adoption and technology in order to deliver 4K is going to happen a lot faster than it did for 1080p. Do you think so? Okay. I mean, let's. Well, 1080p was adapted into te no, it's television. Funny, though, is, is the fact that that even some TV networks still don't broadcast in 1080p. There are TV networks, yeah. major TV networks, that have a ton of money, and they still only broadcast at 720p. Well, I believe CBS, uh, TBS does that, right? Uh, TBS, and I know uh, Fox News. I think Fox News Channel still broadcast at 720p, which I don't understand. Like, it, it's not like Fox News Channel isn't hurting for money. They could broadcast well, easily at 1080p. Nobody's doing 1080p. No TV network is doing 1080p currently. There are, there are some. There are. Uh, not. Yeah. I can't think of any that are doing it currently. I think Fox does. 1080i. Well, yeah. I mean, it, to me, it, when, when you're talking about the TV, it's 1080i, 1080p is interchangeable. Uh, it, it, it's the resolution that I'm talking. Oh, about. Oh, the resolution. Not okay, okay. Released or progressive. Yeah, they're doing a lot of them are doing 1080i. Uh, they're not doing 1080p, but I, I think before they go to 1080, 
4K, they should go to 1080p for the broadcast. But again, this is this is all in the hands of the cable providers and your bandwidth, really. If if you're going to watch 4K, A, you need a 4K TV, and we are not... The masses are not going to go and buy 4K TVs in two years. I mean, no. currently, currently no, uh, yeah, the pricing structure... Me. When I got an HD TV in 2003, uh, I, we, I paid $7,000 for a Hitachi 1080i TV. Okay? Hitachi. Plasma. The thing is still working. It's in my living room. It's one of the best TVs I've ever bought. But it was $7,000. Currently, the 4K TVs that are out are about sixty dollars to $80,000. Uh, the Was it the Samsung? I think Sony has one for I, I like thirty. Or, or Sony just came out with one for $40,000. Okay. So these prices are going to obviously significantly it's, it's gonna drop. Be, it's going to be at least five years before we see TVs in, in the 4K range become reasonable absolutely but that's yeah. why i'm saying i think i think it's going to be more feasible for for 4k to be delivered over the internet before it will be with a tv because tv you have to have uh these giant monitors out there for it and just, we already kind of in a way have this large adoption of people especially gamers that have 1440p monitors yeah interesting yeah, I think you're absolutely right with that. Did you, um, to kind of go to the TV and then we'll move on to something, did you see the Samsung T Smart TV announcement this week? It's not in our notes, but uh, I read about it early in the week, and they're actually doing something fascinating. Uh, they are going to be updating the, the brain of the television every year, and you're going to be able to buy a Samsung Smart TV, I guess, updater, and it's this box that you just connect to the back of the TV, and it changes... Uh, like you'll have like an eight core processor powering your television. And every year you could change this unit. So right now the 2012 models could be updated to 2013 models with this back unit. I think something like that is a great idea for like 300 bucks. You could constantly just update these units every couple mm -hmm. of years. I'm not sold on it. I don't know. It, it seems like it, it looks like a pretty good idea, but can you imagine if they do like a hundred dollar update where you could update all your hardware, all your software, the TV's brand new because the displays aren't really changing that often anymore. It's the no. features that you're getting, and this is a great way for Samsung to kind of capitalize on that. I kind of would like something like that, but I think there there are some standard features that I I just don't understand why they don't include them in all TVs. Why don't you have? Um, wireless in all TVs. It, it, it's it's not that it's that hard to do, or or the fact that you know not every TV that has wireless is capable of uh, this technology called DLNA, which allows you to stream from a server to your TV. Yeah, I don't understand. I just do not understand why so many TVs that have these smart TV things in there with wireless internet that don't have DLNA. Like, why is it that you don't have this very simple technology so that I can stream video from a DLNA server? Yeah, I mean that—that's all business practices. They want—they want to keep—they want to have the lower end and make you go in and buy that, and then see all these features on the higher model, and then upsell you. I mean that—that's really how they make their money. I'd, ra with these I'd rather the the TV that I bought last year. It's a Vizio. Vizio. I, I specifically bought it with the wireless stuff in there because I wanted uh, to be able to stream stuff to it. Turns out you can't. Yeah. You only you only get these little crappy Yahoo connected TV widgets, and it, it's just, it's an awful experience. Like I, quite honestly, I never use it. I bought this TV. I paid a hundred dollars more for this TV specifically for the, the smart TV technology in it, and I never use it. You never use it. Yeah. What is that? <laughs> I I don't think they've it's done well. It's completely worthless to me because it can't freaking stream. Okay, so let me ask you: if, if Vizio came out with an update and said, "Okay, John, you could buy this add-on." It's going to be much faster. You're going to connect it to the back of the TV, and this is going to be the brain for 200 bucks. You could get it, but you're going to have everything you want. Are you going to buy it? Yeah. No. No, because there's other solutions out there for $100 that I could do. Yeah. I can get and do exactly what I want. So why would I pay $200 well, for it? Or much, the fact that you're much you know, smarter I, than I me. have other computers here that I don't necessarily use, and I can just connect it to my TV and do everything that a computer can do on my TV. You're so handy. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I, I guess I want it all in one with, with the way that it's supposed to be, but I don't know. Uh, Google to combine all of its chat services under the Babel name. I kind of like the name. The name's not awful. 
Uh, Google users can now will be able to communicate through Google Talk, Google Hangouts, Google Voice, Google Chat, Google Gmail Chat, and Google Plus. Uh, these are all going to be integrated under one communication service, under one single platform. This is something that I have been baffled by, that Google so fragmented, uh, fragment, fragmented, fragment, fragmented. I can't, I can't, even <laughs> fragmented. Uh, over over like 15 Time different to take platforms. Your pills, Andrew. I know. Hold on. Let me hold on. I got my pills here. <laughs> hold on. Hang on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's time to take them. All right. All right. Here we go. Where we go? Here we go. It's Motrin, people. I do have a headache. So. <laughs> there you go. Are you not mad at me anymore? I took my pills. Good. Okay. It's so fragmented uh, across all these different platforms where I, I, I got a message. Uh, Josh messaged me, Josh Coleman, uh, Coleman Nation, uh, he does a show, T-Force. He messaged me on something the other day, and it kept buzzing on my phone. And, it, and I, it was a Google application. I couldn't figure out what he messaged me on because I've never seen this chat. It turns out he messaged me on Google Plus's chat service. I don't understand why they're not all interconnected, you know? I, I, you know what? This is this has been the problem with Google since day one that they they have all these different projects and different teams are working on them and then they put everything out. Then you end up with one, two, three, four, five, six different chat services for the same thing. I don't even know why. Yeah, yeah. Look, they specifically list Google Chat and Gmail Chat, which is the what same the thing. What the heck is the difference? It's the same thing. Why, why can't it just be the same service that you can use on either Google or Gmail? And it's the same exact thing. I guess the problem would be um, if you – I guess I guess it would pop up everywhere. But I, I don't know why they haven't combined all of this. I thought with Google+, Plus, Google+, Plus would be the standard and everything would be in, revolving around Google+. Plus. There's no need for anything else. I actually thought initially when they got Gizmo 5, they were going to have a desktop chat client. A lot for, of people thought they were. I really... Because in a way, uh, th that was kind of their missing feature is that they didn't have this desktop client that you still had to log into the website in order to run Google Voice. And, and this Gizmo 5 thing, which worked pretty well, yeah. was going to be their solution to be able to do that. Because you could do that but then Google bought it and killed it. They bought it. In, well, they integrated it into Google Talk. That that's mm -hmm. what it became. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it but it didn't have anything to do with what no, people used it for. No, they used nothing. it for Google Voice. They didn't use it for Google Talk. They used it to connect their phone number that they got from Google Voice to their desktop. Well, and then they also bought Grand Central. You got to remember, this was the same time that they got Grand Central. They, they, they up, bought Grand Central to do Google Voice. Yeah, and then they bought they bought uh, Gizmo Five to do Google Talk. So I don't know. It, 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 it's it's so bizarre to me that there's like fifteen thousand different services. But this is great. I'm really excited for this. One this thing that I've been of, asking this, for. This is like very ironic in the fact that they have all these little things here that y you don't really know what the heck it is why they have 15 versions of the same thing and yet they kill off the one thing that people actually use which is Google RSS reader i know <laughs> you're so I, upset I, about that oh yeah absolutely i mean it, it just it, they they did a disservice to themselves because a lot of the people that were die hard google reader fans are going to turn on google Plain and simple is it, they're the type of people that will turn on Google simply because they killed off Google Reader. Yeah, but your only other option is uh, Feedly and a couple other you know small time RSS clients. Yeah. So, are you you know one thing that I've 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 been really disappointed by with Google, uh, like on iOS you have iMessage, and in iMessage your text messages show up there along with your iMessage chat. Mm -hmm. uh, in Windows Phone, you can actually get your Facebook chat uh, updates there. You get your phone. You get... I You're talking about like a unified message It's like inbox. a unified mes message box, and I would love that because with this, like I got to run... You know, I don't run any other messaging services because I don't want to run like 15 applications. I would love it if it just showed up under messaging. Everything showed up there. Yeah. I mean, that's really the way to do it. I'm... 
I don't know why but we with haven't the seen it with Google. To separate them. It, it, it would still need the option to separate them for the people that would rather have them separate. Sure. Listen, listen. if you want to run an AIM client, for example, you should be able to run an AIM client. But if I want to integrate AIM into my messaging service, I want to be able to integrate it in there. But then you have to have APIs to do that, and you have to let people use those APIs. Yes, that is also the case. But I, I think with Google <laughs> and their own services, I don't think they need to allow themselves to use their own services, you know? Yeah. It really uh, comes down to that. Uh, why don't we... Why don't you pick a story? Uh, let's see. Um, let's talk about this uh, T-Mobile uncarrier thing. So this week, T-Mobile said that they're planning a March 26th press event in which they've hinted that they're going to change from you know all the things that people don't like a carrier for, and, and they're going to be the new uncarrier. And we've actually gotten uh, a few leaks about this event already in which they've said that what's going to happen is that they're going to kill off uh, subsidized contracts, basically where you pay um, only $200 for a phone and you get a two-year contract in exchange for the discount on your phone. Whereas now what you're going to end up having to do is pay full price, full price excuse me, for that phone, and in return, instead of a contract, you actually get a discount on the service itself. So what they're saying is that you'll actually have an individual plan now that it comes with unlimited talk and text and web, plus 500 megabytes of high-speed data by default for $60. And then after that, it increases by 2 gigabytes and about $20 or $10 per next plan. So like the next plan up would be um, unlimited talk, text, and web, plus 2 gigabytes for $80. Yeah. So basically what they're saying is that they're going to give you all this stuff that normally, you know, you would only get maybe 450 minutes for, for $80 and 2 gigabytes. Well, we're just going to give you unlimited talk and text, plus all this stuff, as long as you just pay full price for the device that you want. What do you think of this? Do you think this is going to help T-Mobile? Because they really have to do something to kind of stand out. Oh, gosh. I, I honestly do not know which way this is going to go. Uh, my gut tells me that this really isn't going to make a difference because there's still such a minor player compared to AT&T and Verizon that... It just doesn't matter. What I could see happening is that AT&T and Verizon could follow suit and still win over T-Mobile. Yeah, they can, but it, it, how realistic is that? Mm. I, I, honestly, what You know what I see more in, in this announcement is, is just the fact that voice and texting really are less of a concern for carriers nowadays than it is for data. Data is the new big thing. That's where the money is. That's where they're they're making all their money. Yeah. Is that they could practically give away um, voice and texting so long as they keep charging you an inordinate amount of money for your data usage. Um, we also saw, I think, this week that AT and T is coming up with new um, uh, high tiers for business users that have a lot of data usage, like 30 gigabytes and 40 gigabytes. So AT&T is going to charge business users, if they want, $300 for 30 gigabytes of mobile data. To me, that seems like a, a lot of money. And we're still in that sense where we're, we're still paying a lot of money, I think, for our data usage, which is really weird in the fact that data itself is now basically the same as voice and texting it's it's all data yet yeah. you're still charging a lot of money for this stuff i think well i think the 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 fact that it matter is that they don't need you're absolutely right i think i think voice at this point is a secondary feature on these phones i i know it's a it's a phone and that's what you're doing but when we talk about cell phones we don't necessarily talk about the call and using it as an actual phone we want all these features we want the the data more than anything else at this point yeah. Uh, unlimited talk, unlimited text, and, and unlimited web. I mean, you, see, you see a lot of carriers doing the, these unlimited talks and text plans a, as their basic starting point for their plans now. It's because they, they see data as their big breadwinner now. Yeah. I, I mean, that. how are they, what are they doing with higher tiers as far as data goes? Are they, uh, is it truly unlimited with them? The unlimited uh, data? 
Uh, nobody has unlimited data, as far as I know. Nothing. Nobody's truly unlimited. I mean, why not? Or why not? Unlimited. They still throttle you. Oh, they still throttle you. I mean, why they could they could totally separate themselves from everybody else if they offer unthrottled, unbandwidth, you know, uh, unlimited data for four G. Actually, they do say you know they they have unlimited data here for, um, I think ninety dollars. Yeah, but if I start doing Netflix streaming with four G, how what are the what, how likely is it that they're going to start throttling me to some extent? You know what I mean? Like, I don't think I. I, I, I think highly... it all depends on on how they've inputted you into their system and, and what that plan entails. Because it, it's it's like AT and T has those higher tiers now, where you can actually pay three hundred dollars for thirty gigabytes. Yeah, but I, you I, could I... also pay you know fifty bucks for four gigabytes and yeah. get throttled after four gigabytes. Yeah. Interesting though. I, I I like having the competition for the phones. I just don't know if if 4G if uh, I'm sorry, uh, T-Mobile is going to be the 4G provider that kind of changes the mold for us. No, I I, I don't. I don't. But listen, think we, we have come we have PCS. come a long way, and I'll tell you how we've come a long way. Text messaging rates. Uh, t- we I was complaining about this about three years ago when we were doing the show on how much of a ripoff text messaging is and how they're kind of hitting you over the head with these with these rates where it, it makes no sense. They're, they're literally charging us a astronomical fee for text messaging per bit, per data. That has totally gone away where text messaging now is totally bundled in. Minutes, phone usage minutes, is now unlimited. Everybody's offering unlimited. So we have really mm-hmm. come a long way with those things. We're at the point where they still don't understand how 4G should be done. They don't understand what we are looking for as users and they're trying to kind of hit us over the head with this also now with uh you sign up and and you're getting you know four gigs and if you god forbid you go over that because now you're going to be in trouble yeah like i said data is where it's at now for the carriers um and and as far as users are concerned it's it's a struggle between you know the cost of it and being able to do what we're used to here at home where we don't have these uh, extremely limited um, limits basically, like you know, I can I could blow through three hundred gigabytes here at home, but on my cell phone I can only get four gigabytes. Yeah, and, and but they're virtually the same speed. LTE and, and and our home broadband connections are you know virtually the same sure. speed. They're it's almost imperceptible to the average person how fast the speed is. I was able so to get in, order in to, Manhattan. In Manhattan, I was able to get with LTE the other day. I was in the city on Wednesday, and I was just I had both my um. Where is it? Here it is. I had the uh, AT and T Galaxy Note two, and I had my Verizon Nexus, uh, Verizon uh, Galaxy Nexus, and I ran a test. Both of them had you know four bars, everything. I was able to get almost thirty megabits up and down on the, both phones. Thirty yeah, megabits. You know, the sad thing too is that as more and more people come over to LTE, that's going to go away. I've I've already seen it on Verizon where you know uh, now that the iPhone has you know LTE capabilities, the network has a diminished capacity. Yeah, yeah. Because there's just more people using LTE now. It it well, do you think a lot of people are using it? Oh yeah. Do you, you yeah. think you think it's it's gonna? I would like to see the percentage of users now if they've kind of jumped ship to four G. LTE is an amazing thing yeah. once you use it. Well, it's a there's, series there's of no tubes, way obviously. Using, yeah, it is, but I could never really go back to a phone that's 3G only. Yeah. It, it, even when I dropped occasionally to 3G, it's just like, huh, great. Because it, there's something to be said for having virtually the same speed at home and on my phone wirelessly. Hey, uh, I want to go into another story here, and and this is kind of disappointing, and I'm curious on what you think. Uh, There's a story coming out that Apple may launch a cheaper iPhone uh, that's pretty much plastic. Everything's going to be plasticky on this thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's for emerging markets and lower-cost devices. Uh, The story is that Apple's next-generation iPhone flagship phone will be the iPhone 5S, Fine, it makes sense for me, but they're also looking to have a low-end iPhone that's going to be the same as the 4-inch form factor of the uh, iPhone 5, but it's going to have plastic casting and no retina display. 
Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what the price point will be for this. Maybe $99 price point on this thing. But do you think this is necessarily a good thing for Apple to be doing? Because now they're kind of separating themselves as they're not that, wow, look at the quality of an Apple product. They're just going to be like everything else on the market. Well, and I'm not listen. I'm not, and I'm not saying that Apple has the best quality. I'm just saying the perception of Apple products is not the same as a perception of a $300 PC on the market. Yeah, we've 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 seen this rumored low cost iPhone for you know six months now, and, and in a way, this does kind of make sense. I mean, if you think about it, what do you want? What does Apple do now for low cost iPhones? They sell the previous generation. But now that we have, you know, the iPhone 4S and the iPhone 5, which are both Retina displays, when the iPhone 4S becomes, you know, the lower, uh, low-cost iPhone that they're trying to push, because it still has Retina, they're still going to have to charge a little bit more money for that, I think. And, and in a way, by doing that, by doing this new device that has plastic casing and no Retina they can offer something that's equivalent just at a lower cost to the latest generation. I mean, I guess, but how much lower are you going to go? Right now, the 4S is selling for 100 bucks. Right, but if you think about it, 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 it has a retina display in it. It does. What they're saying is that eventually uh, all the Apple products are going to come with, you know, like retina. But in order to fulfill that low cost market that they they have there there are people that will go and buy you know the the last year's generation of the iphone yeah, but what, because it's cheaper yeah no no no. they do that 99 bucks but how much cheaper are you going to go with a non-retina now uh, you're going to go 50 bucks I, I think it would still be 99 well, no, the, four, the 4g is free right the 4g currently is free but i think they'll the always four, charge the you know yeah uh, I guess the four is free at some places. The four S is ninety nine dollars, and then the, you have the five. But I, I guess I mean maybe maybe they could go to the same form factor. You're right. Maybe maybe with a non Retina, that's your entry model Apple product. Uh, it's fifty bucks, forty nine bucks for you know low cost. And, and by doing that, they, they'll offer something that has you know much more close respects to the latest generation. But see, this is where it gets tricky. Does that cut into their their margins because now? How many people would have gotten in to buy the latest and the greatest iPhone? And they're going to go and buy the lower one. I'll tell Who's you, I know saying? many people. I know many people, and Apple will probably disagree with me on this because they're saying, "Well, the people going in and buying an iPad two are going to buy an iPad two. They're not going to buy an iPad, you know, new iPad." That is not true. Uh, a lot of offices uh, were buying iPad twos for their employees, and now you yeah. know what they're doing when the iPad three and the iPad four now are, have come out. They're still going and buying iPad 2s for their employees because it's $100 cheaper. Yeah. It, it, hasn't, it hasn't rolled over like that. That, that, that concept where, where they're going to go, if, they, if you're a serious buyer, you're going to buy it. If you're not going to buy it, we're, we're actually targeting people that wouldn't buy our product. That's not true. People are actually but, going but and buying an iPad 2. people that too. buy in bulk are a lot different than the average person. I could tell you many people that went into the Apple store and bought an iPad 2 this Christmas and not the latest iPad because it was cheaper and they don't know the difference. Yeah. So well, that's the thing. They don't know the difference. Yeah. And and you know what? I, I I think the iPad 2 is a piece of crap at this point. Oh, absolutely because it's so, it's it's pretty it's what, a year and a half or two old now? Yeah. It's 2 years old. I mean I mean that's the sad fact is that we have all these great devices but in 2 years time they're all obsolete with the type of technology with the pace of technology that we have today. Yeah. Uh pick a story, John. Go into something. Uh, I kind of want to get your thoughts on this um, fee f on digital wallets that Visa wants. This is an interesting story. Um, Visa's chief, um, his last name is Sharf, says that he wants to charge a fee for these digital wallets that everybody has, such as Google and uh, iOS. He wants a fee so that because they're saying that uh, let me see, let me try to find the correct. Quoting this because he's saying that it's a logistical nightmare as they try to assign reward points and accommodate other programs they set up for transactions. Um, I, I don't know how much you've read about this story, but this to me sounds interesting. The fact that it almost seems like they're just trying to be as greedy as possible, saying, "Oh well, you're doing this, so we get to charge you another fee." So, are they charging you or the vendor the fee? 
You know, that's a good question. Because I, I think I think it's the vendor that they're going to charge the fee to. Like PayPal doesn't. Well, PayPal doesn't charge you a fee when um, uh, you buy stuff. Only when you transfer money. Currently, mobile wallets require credit cards to work. So each time a person pays for a product with one of those wallets, they're still taking credit from a card. Fees are then paid to the card issuers for that transaction. Yeah. PayPal, like other providers, pay a lot of fees for those transactions. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm curious. It's curious because in a way, I, I don't think these digital wallets have really taken off to the point where it really even matters whether they charge a fee for this or not. It's not like they have a high volume of people using digital wallets. Yeah, and, and, and they kind of, this is not really making you want to use it. If you're a vendor, you're not gonna you're not gonna take it because now on top of that, are they because if it's a credit card that you're using, they're still getting a cut because you're using the credit card. They have to process the credit card on their side. Further out, yeah, and further in the story, I think I think they kind of go into a little bit more detail as to the logistics that they're talking about is the fact that they don't necessarily get the same information as if you actually swiped your card. They don't get that. Because there's more data on that magnetic strip on your credit card than what's actually stored in your digital wallet. Yeah. Now, I think that's kind of what they are trying to make up for. And I could understand if they're like, oh, they want to they have a fee on this because it, it costs more to secure this stuff. Like that I could understand. If you're talking about charging me a fee to have better security for my digital wallet, I can completely understand something like that. Yeah, I, I'm curious on what their fee is. Have they said what the fee would be? No, they haven't said anything about the fee. Yeah. It, it just it's basically a discussion at this point that they they would like to charge you know PayPal, Google, and everybody else that has some sort of digital wallet for these transactions, which I think is kind of weird in a way. They're saying that they're almost making us out to be the victim for using these products. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go into one more story and then we could do our uh, picks of the week. Uh, Google Android units reportedly building a smartwatch. This oh is getting crazy, and 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 again, this is the this is the <laughs> tablet market all over again. When the when Apple announced that they were going to come out with an iPad, everybody freaked out, and everybody started pushing out these insane products, trying to one up Apple. And uh, to be honest, nobody was able to really do it properly until uh, the iPad came out, and Android kind of got their act together with their lower end devices, but. We haven't even seen what this smartphone will be. We don't even know if it's if it's a, a device that'll do well in any kind of market. We don't even know who it's targeting, really. And now we're seeing, you know, Android manufacturers are working on one. Samsung has recently uh, been working on a wearable watch that's running Android. We've seen this stuff has been going on for five years. Oh my god! And say. and you know what? We've it, seen this. This actually started. This is this actually started with. Uh, I think it's called the Impulse smartwatch, originally for BlackBerry, it, it, that never really even made it to market. A lot of these things that these these smartwatch ideas rarely ever make it to market. Uh, the Pebble smartwatch is basically the only smartwatch that's ever made it to market, largely based on the fact that they just had a lot of hype push to them and a lot of people that bought into it. And I just don't see that. It's really going to be that great of a product. Even even the Pebble smartwatch, it's a neat idea, but I don't think functionality is is, is quite all there. It, it, it's very limited, in my opinion. But people don't wear Not watches that, anymore. People don't yeah, wear but, watches. I, I mean, I wear a watch as as a piece of jewelry. I don't wear a watch to look at the time. Uh, I, the the concept of of a watch really isn't there anymore. So what yeah. would you do with this device, well, and what features are you going to offer with it that you couldn't offer on your phone? Well, what they are saying is that Google wants to put, I think, uh, Google Now in their smartwatch, which I think would make it a lot more useful than something like the the, the, the Pebble watch or whatever it is. Because Google Now is a, is a really interesting product, and I think it does it a really great good. job. Yeah. No, Google and, now and by is having really good. that that. that connection to your to your phone you don't necessarily have to pull out your your phone in order to use your phone yeah i i guess uh but i'm curious this is going to be a total free-for-all now with every single phone that comes out is going to have a watch but this companion. could also be this this could also just turn it into a google cube thing where they come out with this idea that you know 
ends up being too expensive and nobody really cares about it. So I want like I want to I want to watch like a phone that turns into a slap bracelet and I could just wear it around my arm. <laughs> and it'll be glass and it could be it could bend. Uh, that's what I want. I don't know. I found this interesting that this is now years. the craze. I, I mean, we, we've kind of, kind of gone to this this weird thing where this is now the thing. This is what we're talking I, I about. Smartwatch things are just completely overrated. I really don't see the appeal in them, and, and I don't understand why why people even buy into the, this Pebble smartwatch thing because I absolutely see absolutely zero appeal in the product. Listen, and here's the crazy part about this, okay? So let's say this thing is going to cost... Three hundred dollars, right? Let, let's come yeah, up with this hypothetical number. It's a freaking new phone. Yeah, three hundred bucks. Do nearly the same amount of stuff. Like for three hundred dollars, it's just this tiny little circuit board that yeah. really doesn't do a whole lot of anything. Like I don't understand how they charge three hundred dollars for that. I, I'll give you. I'll give you an example. Let's say this thing is going to be three hundred dollars, and every year you got to buy a new one, right? You got to upgrade. It's the not thing. worth it. You could have bought a very nice higher end watch. By the time you know, within a couple of years, five hundred bucks for a watch, you can buy, you can get a decent watch for that. I, I don't, mm-hmm. get, I don't get the crazy, you know, uh, I don't get that whole <laughs> thing about spending that's that much into money. Into these high end watches, I mean, a hundred bucks, okay, I guess he's spending a hundred dollars and getting some sort of like companion device. But the odds of me yeah, using I, this I thing are going to be, in order I'm never going to use it. Kind of what we've seen with the with tablets is that you know, in order for these things to catch on, they have to be dirt cheap. Yeah, I don't know. I, I it's baffling to me, but I guess I, I listen. I was wrong about the iPad and I was wrong about the iPhone. So you know what? I'm gonna say this is the greatest thing ever. Apple's gonna sell <laughs> billions of these, and this is gonna be the next big thing because I'm not doubting them again. Every time a de- they have released a device, I have said this is stupid, and it has turned out to be a, a number one seller. This this is Google that we're talking about. Well, Apple's gonna release one too. They don't, they don't too, necessarily so. always have the greatest track record. If you look at the Google Cube thing, no, that thing they, was they a mess. announced the product and killed it. What well, was the worst thing ever? <laughs> I mean, really, it was really the worst thing. Uh, John, you know what time it is, right? Picks of the week. It is time for our picks of the week. Uh, let me get the lower third going here. You know what? I got to put it in. We have so many lower thirds now where it's so difficult to find them. Uh, picks of the week is where John, myself, and whoever is our guest pick a product, a website, a service that we like, and uh, we present it to you guys. And this week, John, what is your product? I have another iOS app. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, applications out there, third-party calendars that you can use for your iPhone or iPad. Uh, one of the newest ones is called Sunrise Calendar, and it's a pretty neat little uh, application that I think improves a lot on the stock calendar. Um, one of the things that I really just don't like about the stock calendar is just that it gives you all four or five weeks in, in the month, which I think kind of takes up a little bit too much space. Whereas Sunrise Calendar will actually only show you the first basically 10 days of a month. So it, it's got this more of a smaller month view with a much larger agenda view, which I think is a lot more important to me because then I can easily see a more detailed look at what's coming up during my day. And it's really cool because it actually splits it up into uh, morning, afternoon, and evening. It's connected to your Facebook and Google. When you launch it, you can sign in with either Facebook or Google. And it'll actually bring in either your Google and or Facebook calendar and events, which is really cool. So if you have, you know, birthdays or events on Facebook that you use all the time, that's automatically synced over to your Sunrise calendar, which you don't necessarily get with the stock calendar app. Um, you can tag events. Uh, you, you have time zone support. You can easily add events, which is really cool. It has awesome synchronization. Um, it's compatible with Google Calendar, like I said. And best of all, it's 100% free. I don't know if you have this up on the screen, but it's a very well-designed application. It looks great. It even has Google Maps for directions. So if you have an address in there for an event, you can easily get directions to to that event, which is really cool. You can also see like weather forecasts based on your location, which is another great thing that the stock calendar just doesn't have. So to me, for a free application that works this well, it's a no-brainer that you have to get and use Sunrise Calendar. That's you really cool, actually. Find it in the iTunes store. And it's free. Absolutely. Very, very cool. Uh, my pick this week is also a, um, a mobile app, but it's for Android. So we're going to pick the other side. I believe it's also on iOS, but my 
I'm, I'm picking the one for Android uh, right now. I, I believe I had featured them a couple months ago as a pick of the week, and they have released some updates since then, and it is Pocket Casts, and uh, it is a podcast downloading application. Uh, you really don't have too many options when it comes to that via Android because Android doesn't have one built in like, like uh, Apple does, but this is a phenomenal, phenomenal application. They really changed the layout of it. Uh, here's some screenshots of the latest Pocket Cast. Pocket Cast 4 is the new one. Uh, they also have a video here, so I'm going to go through it. Uh, they make it very easy. They have their own selection of podcasts in their in their layout. So you ha they have a directory that, that you could pick from, or you could add your own podcast to it. So if you have an RSS to a podcast that is not listed there, you could easily add it to the service, video and audio, so it does everything. And it's a really beautiful layout. So I really, really like it. And once you log into one account, so let's say you create an account with them, you could take that account over to iOS. You could take it over to your iPad, your uh, Nexus, and it's uni it's universal. So it works on all the platforms. It's not just you get everything on one and that's it. You got to put it on the other one. So that's my pick, Pocket Cast for Android. I believe it's also on iOS and uh, everywhere else. Uh, iOS and Android, I'm, I don't know about anything else, actually. But uh, it's, it's <laughs> a really cool application. I really, really like it. That's my daily podcast listening application at this point. It's a very sexy UI. Very, very sexy. sexy. Yeah, you know, you know, it's very important to have a good UI on these things. We talk about content consumption. Oh, yeah. We talk about you could get the content anywhere, but this really separates you from other pla places. I think that's very important. You can have an application that functionally works great, works very well, but if it doesn't look good, I'm not going to be interested. Yeah. I really like it. Pocket Cast is the app. Uh, and we'll have it in our uh, our show notes with links to our picks of the week. Hey, John, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Mm -hmm. We had a couple of issues early on, but it seems to have settled down, and you're doing 1080p video to me now. So Cool. It's it's fascinating how you were having bandwidth problems, and we were having packet loss, and all of a sudden it just settled, and everything is perfect now. Well, I, uh, I, I stopped watching the uh, feed, and I think that helped. Ah, that's it. There you go. There so. you go. John, any uh, any plugs, anything you want to promote? Uh, follow me on Twitter, at Suncast. That's S-U-N-K-A-S-T. And that's about it. Uh, come back next week, Friday at 5 p.m. for Tech News Weekly. Thank you. And uh, you can follow me at Andrew Zarian. And, of course, if you miss any portion of the show, you can go to our website, gfknetwork.com, and catch the archive there. And we'll see you all next week. Good night, everybody.